How's it going, y'all? This is Nate Drolet, and welcome back to the Advanced Climber series. I appreciate y'all tuning back in, and without delaying any further, I'll go ahead and get started. Number 56. When to stop looking for better beta, and just try harder. Oh man, this is a tough one to nail down well. Most of us fall on either side of the spectrum on this. Either we really want things to feel perfect, and so we are constantly hunting for all the best minutiae we can find to make this climb feel as easy as possible or as comfortable as possible. Or on the other end, some people just want to give rips and try really hard. There are advantages to both and there are disadvantages to both. One of the big advantages for hunting down better beta all of the time, trying to find all this little minutia, is we're going to level up our skills and different techniques. We're going to really figure out what works when and what doesn't. We're going to become better with the tools we have. And if we're open to suggestions from other people, we look at video, we're going to learn new techniques this way too. If you can't figure out how to do this move on your own and you outsource the information as much as you can, you might learn all these new different techniques. And that's really cool. That's super useful. This means that the people who spend a lot of time dialing things in are likely getting better skill development out of this practice. On the other side, we have the people who just want to try hard, grip it and rip it. These people are likely going to get a better strength stimulus out of their climbing because they're spending more of their session trying hard, and they're likely doing bigger links at a time rather than pulling on, trying one individual move, not sure if it's going to work or not, kind of hesitating, dropping off. They're just pulling on and trying hard. This can be great for a slightly better strength stimulus, probably good for confidence, frankly, because you have to climb confidently to do that. You're instilling that kind of belief in yourself. And it's worth noting that the ability to try very hard while staying composed is one of the most important skills you can have as a high level climber. We're at the point to where it's not good enough to only try hard or only move well. You have to be able to combine the two. That's a pretty hard lesson to learn for a lot of climbers who try to have this more nuanced technical approach. Sometimes the beta is to try harder. If we're looking at disadvantages for the try hard group, I mean, this one's kind of obvious. You can end up spinning your wheels for a long time on something because you didn't look for beta long enough or you just didn't find enough nuance within the beta that you had, maybe it would only take you five or 10 minutes of really dialing that one move in individually rather than trying from the ground every time for you to just be able to send this thing fast. Another disadvantage here is it is exhausting to just try hard all the time. If every single go you decide you're gonna pull on and fight to the death, that is exhausting. You can only do that so many times in a session, and we don't want to waste those great efforts. If we're looking at the two groups, the tryhard versus the beta hunters, I believe that the tryhard is an easier problem to fix. If we're trying to get closer to that middle, that Goldilocks zone, I believe it's easier for the tryhards to move towards that than it is the beta hunters. If you are always trying hard and suddenly people can show you what good tactics can do for you, what good beta hunting can do for you, it's such a quick return on investment. You immediately see the results. You say, that really helped me. I went from falling on this move every time to I rehearsed it three times in isolation and then I did the whole boulder. Amazing. That direction tends to be much easier for people to go in than the other way. If you're a beta hunter, you really need to ask yourself, why are you doing this? Because there are valid reasons. A lot of sport climbers find themselves doing this on hard boulders because with a sport climb, it is so important to really nail things down. If I need to climb a V8 70 feet up a sport climb, I need that thing to feel really, really good. It is so important for me to have that dialed. But if I'm doing a V8 that's right off the ground, do I really need it perfectly dialed? Do I need to spend all the time in the world finding every bit of minutia? Probably not. If I fall on a V8 that's right off the ground, oh no, I guess I'll rest five minutes, eat some twin snakes, and uh, try again, and I'm going to have plenty of tries that day. It's not that big of an issue. So I can err towards the side of not dialed in enough with a pretty low risk. As a sport climber, if I'm on a 90-foot climb, with a V8 near the top, I might only get one or two tries in a day, especially 
if there are other people trying the route that day, if the route goes in the sun at a certain point, I might have a very narrow window that I can try this. So what that means is I can't just keep rapid firing this boulder. I need to have it dialed in so that when I get there with some sort of fatigue, I can climb well on it. If you are a spore climber and you're finding yourself overly obsessing with all the minutia when you're bouldering or even training on boulders, which can become a problem, I believe it's important to try and shift more towards the try-hard side. How do we do just enough work on the beta finding so that we can give ourselves a good chance of sending? If you're someone who prides themselves on always finding the best beta and the perfect solution for yourself, are you doing this because you believe you are so skilled that all of this extra time is really turning into a material output for faster sends and sends of harder climbs? Or are you doing this because you're hesitant to try hard? Do you just want things to feel comfortable and dialing everything in in this way, taking out all uncertainty in this equation so that you can stay in your comfort zone? Unfortunately, I see more people fall in that latter category. We hunt for beta and try and perfect everything, not because it is the best way possible, but because it's what makes us feel the most comfortable. And if you're one of those people, I've got a drill for you to help. This drill is called 10 minute takedowns. You're gonna find a new climb that you've never been on before. It should be one grade above flash level. You're gonna give yourself 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, you can be as tactical as you want. Try every move in isolation, do tiny links, brush holds, like stack pads, feel all the holds, get power spots, climb into the sequences from different holds or different boulders. Do anything you can as tactically as you can for 10 minutes. And when 10 minutes is up, shoes off, you're resting. You're going to rest three to five minutes. It really doesn't matter. You want to be moderately well rested. If you've got plenty of time, sure, five minutes. That's great. For people who are a little more on a time crunch, three is perfect. Take a three minute rest and then you give a red point go from the ground. If you send it, amazing. If you don't, you're going to rest another three to five minutes and you get one more try. And that's it. You're not allowed to try the boulder again for the rest of the day. And that part is super important. People who love to beta hunt can get trapped in this idea of always having more goes. And that's a problem because you won't. Sometimes you're going to need to pull the trigger. It might be the last day of the trip. Rain might be coming in. Sun is about to hit your project. There's a huge lineup that just pulled up for the climb you want to do. You need to send right now. We don't have time to dilly-dally, figure out all the minutiae, and just keep giving more and more goes in this attrition warfare approach to sending. You need to do it now. And that's what the 10-minute takedown is for. You get your 10 minutes, be as tactical as you want, and then you get two good efforts. And that's it. You have to walk away for the rest of the day. It's important that there feels like consequences to not sending. The last thing that I'll say on this subject is that I mentioned earlier that there's this Goldilocks zone of not chewing too much beta hunting and not just giving rips from the ground blindly every single go. Somewhere in the middle. Our goal is not to be perfectly in the middle. I think perfection is an unrealistic goal and it sets us up for failure if that is the standard we're judging ourselves against. If the only way of succeeding is through perfection, you're going to fail every time. We're not going to do that. We're not going to aim for perfection. All I ask is, can you catch yourself before you go off the rails? Can you catch yourself when you start to get in that bull sees red, just try, try, try mindset? If you can see that as it's starting to happen and throttle it back, perfect. We don't need to prevent it entirely because we're always going to be existing on this pendulum between the two. We just want to make sure that pendulum doesn't swing too far in either direction. If you're feeling called out by this content and want some more of that in your life, hit subscribe down below. Number 57, being able to run a climb through your head in first person. What this means is being able to close your eyes and imagine yourself climbing the boulder or route. I always forget routes. And imagining yourself grabbing the handholds, stepping on the footholds. Can you kind of feel what it's supposed to feel like? Visualization is a really useful tool in sports, and especially in high skill sports. While this isn't a make or break tool for high level climbers, 
it really helps. Being able to do this well goes so far. It helps with problem solving faster. It helps with remembering beta more quickly. It also will help you hear what other people are saying whenever they're talking about beta and imagine yourself in that situation. Because it's one thing to look up at the wall and say, I think my body fits there. But if you can close your eyes and imagine what that position will actually be, where how your body will fit in that space, that is enormous. And this takes practice. This takes practice for everyone. It's completely normal for this to feel clunky and awkward or like you just can't do it. And if that's the case, I've got a handful of tips for you. First, try running beta through your head while standing up. Position makes a shocking difference here. If I'm trying to run project beta through my head, I have to either be standing up, sitting up upright, or if I'm trying to do it before I go to sleep and I'm a side sleeper, I have to lay on my back because if I'm laying on my side, everything feels wrong. It feels like I'm topsy-turvy. I can't imagine where things are supposed to be in space if I'm on my side. For me, standing up and even miming out the positions is a really good entry point for this. This gives your brain just a few more cues to kind of pull from. If you're actually going through and miming positions, that might feel a little bit easier for you than simply closing your eyes and imagining yourself going through the motions. Another thing that I find really useful is instead of thinking about holds like hands and feet as individual kind of coordinates or like you're playing battleship and okay, I'm grabbing a hold at F7 and putting a foot at B2, things like that. That can feel like a very hard to grasp method for a lot of people. So what I like to do instead is think about positions. Think about the shape of your body. If you're trying to imagine what something will feel like, or if you're trying to even remember beta, instead of thinking, well, my hand was here, hand was here, foot was there, think about what shape your body was in. Where were you holding tension in your body? What was your posture like? What limbs were doing the most work? If you can connect your bodily sensations with this beta framing, it will help you so much when it comes to memory as well as problem solving. Oftentimes, if I can't remember where a foot was on a climb, I'll try and think what this move feels like. And I'll think, okay, I'm shifting, I'm completely over this left foot, I'm kind of bent sideways, and that foot's just higher than I want it to be and a little closer to my body than I want it to be. I'm trying to think of what does this position feel like? What does this beta feel like for me? Rather than what does it look like? And when I do that, when I go through and I say, okay, it's a little higher than I want, it's a little closer than I want, I can now look and say, what fits the bill? Well, that foot's exactly where that feels like it should be. For some reason, it would appear that we are better at remembering feelings and sensations and shapes than pure coordinates on a wall. And it's for that reason, among all the others that I listed, that becoming skilled with running beta through your head in first person, being able to see the wall through your closed eyes and know what it will look like is so useful. We get to really bridge that gap between brain and body. Number 58, if you wanna climb V10, you need to climb on V10. This is one of those tips that lands in the category of common sense as an always common practice. Because yes, of course, you have to climb on V10s if you wanna climb V10. But why are we so bad at this? Man, we're terrible. So many climbers, especially advanced climbers, will really fall into this trap. Early on, it's kind of easy to try whatever. I mean, shoot, rock climbing's hard no matter what when you climb V3. Yeah, sure, I'll try V8. Who cares? I'm going to fall on the first move anyways. It's not a big deal. I'm already falling on everything else in this boulder field. As we advance in climbing, a few things happen. One is we become more skilled. And that's fun. Unfortunately, it, we can create this little bubble of comfort around that. You're really good at climbing V8 and pretty good at V9. Maybe you've been doing this for quite a few years. You've been climbing 5-10 years at this point. And it feels good to finally feel good on the wall and be a good climber. Maybe it's been a year or two since you've actually projected and worked for something. And you've lost touch of that. It's possible that this next grade represents you having to fail again, 
having to kind of look dumb and struggle again. And that's not very enjoyable, especially when you're finally feeling like a competent climber. What a lot of people end up doing is they retreat. They want to build a massive pyramid and say, well, I need to do every V6 and every V7 and every V8 if I'm going to climb V10. You don't. Or they might try and train so hard that V10 just happens on its own. They're going to become so overpowered that they can just go and do V10. If you've been stuck at a grade for a while and you train so hard and become so strong that you can just go do the next grade without much effort, you waited way too long. You traded time for comfort. This can happen at any grade, but what we most commonly see is that it's the big benchmark grades that get people hung up. That could be 13A, 14A, V10. If you're European, that could be French 8A or Font 8, 8A, maybe French 8B, if we're still keeping kind of in that advanced category here. But it doesn't have to be those. Maybe it's the grade that when you first started climbing, all the strong people around you, that's what they climbed. Oh man, V8 was hard when you first started. That's what all the strong people in your gym climbed. So maybe you raced up through the grades V5, 6, 7, and you got up to just below where the strong people are in your area or at your gym, and you feel like you've stagnated there. Maybe you've even convinced yourself that's where the hard stuff really begins. Where I'm at, anyone can get to here, but the grade disparity is so significant from V7 to V8 or V9 to 10 or 11 to 12, whatever you want to tell yourself. But I'm here to say it's probably more between the ears than it is on the wall. If you're guilty of this, if you're one of these people who says, I want to climb 13A so badly, but you never end up trying it, what I want you to do, I mean, obviously it's just... Just go try it. Why not? Have you, have you considered just trying it? Look, here's the thing. I totally get it. I was guilty of this. And actually, for, for me, it was 13A. Fortunately, I had a friend who called me out on this. I had wanted to climb 513 so badly. And he asked me, well, how many 513s have you tried? I was like, well, I've tried like two and they both felt hard. He was like, okay. One, it's a new grade. Of course it feels hard. Two, if you've only tried two of them, how do you know that it's actually that hard. What if you just picked two that were very challenging for you? He had a good point. I was upset with him for it, but I listened. And now I take this advice and I push it off as if it's my own. The first step, if you're guilty of this, is just being aware of it. Can you stop and say, okay, yeah, I am guilty of this. I want the next grade to feel comfortable, or I don't think I have earned the next grade yet. I should go try it. Being aware of it, huge. The next thing to keep in mind, and this is for people who've been climbing for a long time, is try and think back in the past of how hard was V7 when you first tried it, or V6, whatever it is for you, a grade that really meant something in the past. Man, you probably fought for your life for that thing, and it took you so long. But look back at it now. You can probably go just do those climbs. It's not even something that really registers to you. With this new hard grade, you're going to have to fight. It's going to feel hard. It's going to feel like the next level because it is. That's okay. Prepare yourself mentally and emotionally for it and get after it. Final note here. This is not a free pass to skip building a pyramid. If you're someone who has done three V7s, one V8, one V9, and you're hearing all of this and you're like, oh, wow, you know, Nate's saying... I should go climb more V10 if I want to climb V10. Look, I'm saying it, but not to you. You need to build that pyramid out. Go try them. Honestly, there's no harm in trying harder climbs. Try everything. You might surprise yourself. You might be on some meteoric rise through the grades. You don't need to build a pyramid right now. You could be that person. But most of us aren't, frankly. If we're, And that's not me trying to insult you. That's just, statistically speaking, most of us aren't on a meteoric rise right now. If you've been climbing long enough to consider yourself in the advanced experience category, not many of us are having exponential growth in our climbing improvement at this point. And that's totally normal. That's fine. That's how development and everything goes. We have a really quick increase in skill and strength in those early years, and it tapers off. 
you are still improving and you still can improve for many, many years from now, but it's probably not at the crazy rate that you had when you were brand new. Build your pyramids, become well-rounded, but don't be afraid to try the next hard thing. Number 59, long arm tension, staying within a good position and reaching out of it. So what do I mean by this? Whenever you watch a beginner climb, normally the first thing they do is they hold onto jugs like they're little life rafts. You know, they grab a jug, pull it to their chest, and just kind of reach out to whatever they can. This doesn't work for very long. Pretty quickly, you learn you have to abandon the hold you're on and actually move towards the next hold. Your arms are only so long, you can't reach very far if you're really tucked in here. So what we end up having to do is we learn to move towards holds. We also figure out that this feels much stronger because we get to distribute the weight between both arms better. If I'm tucked in here and I'm reaching out, all of my weight is on this one arm, and that's really strenuous. The best example of this is compression. It feels very strong to be directly between the two holds. You're weighting them evenly, your shoulders are in a very strong position. That feels very good. It's weird if you're going to compress, you know, with one arm at your chest, one arm out to the side. There's a next step though. If step one, as a beginner, was clutching everything to your chest, step two is moving towards holds, step three is we're going back to bringing things really close to us. You are now strong enough and skilled enough that we can regress in this skill and go back to keeping things really tight into us to do harder moves. There are two main reasons why you'd want to do this. One, it takes advantage of unevenly distributing the stress between your hands. To put more simply, the hand that's really close to you that you're like locked off on, more of your weight's going to be on that hold because your body is closer to that hold versus the one that's far out. This can be really useful, let's say if you're on a jug and you're reaching out to a tiny little crimp, why would I want my weight to be perfectly distributed between a micro crimp and a jug? That's terrible. I want as much weight on that jug as I can, especially when I'm initially latching a hold. Because when we first latch a hold, there's a big spike in force of us hitting it and having to control the outward momentum of our body coming away from the wall and reeling back in. And we want to dampen out that peak force as much as we can. There's a few good ways to do it, but one is if we stay closer to the better hold and just extend our arm to its full maximum length, we'll be able to hit that next hold while controlling as much as we can with this jug that's near us. There is one obvious downside, and that's that this extended arm is a very hard position to hold. You know, it's almost like a half iron cross. We're not very strong with our arm completely extended out to the side, but that's okay. You're an advanced climber. You are stronger now. We can trade a little bit of big muscle physical strength, this iron cross strength, to make the handhold a little easier to grab. So maybe I will do this big move, grab this little crimp, almost like it's in an iron cross, but a lot of my weight's in my closer arm. I now have the hold controlled. I don't have to deal with that big peak force of smashing into the crimp. And now I can typewriter my body over and really settle into the small crimp. So that's reason number one why this can be advantageous. We can keep more weight on a good hold to be able to grab worse holds and better control. The second reason why this can be useful is because maybe the start position is in really good balance. And if you move out of that position to go to the next hold, you're immediately going to barn door or swing away. Because of that, we might need to create a little momentum and kind of pulse back into the start position, reach out, grab the next hold. Now that you have it in controlled, you can create tension and slowly unwind yourself out to fight that barn door. Maybe this barn door you can control statically, but you would never be able to control it with the added momentum of moving towards the hold. Once you know what to look for, you will see high level climbers using long arm tension all of the time. They'll even hold cuts like big aggressive swings with one arm fully pulled in and the other arm really extended out. And they can do this because their shoulders are very strong and it allows them to hold much harder swings by distributing the weight accordingly to whichever handhold feels better. If the idea of long arm tension still feels a little confusing, you can also think about it as you don't always have to be directly between the two holds you're on. Play with that. Number 60. Understand that things can still feel bad even when you're using the correct methods. 
I wish this wasn't the case. Unfortunately, as we do harder and harder climbs, movements become very novel and unique and strange. And you're going to encounter so many moves that just feel awful. It's going to feel so foreign to you, but you still have to try and try hard. We need to learn how to separate out how a move subjectively feels, this feels bad, versus how it objectively goes. Well, I did it. Anytime you're learning a new skill, it's going to feel clunky and strange and weird. And rock climbing's weird. Rocks are not built for human use. We are trying to mold ourselves into these shapes. They are physical puzzles that just exist, and we're trying to do what we can with the tools we have to move through them. This means things aren't going to feel perfect, and they're not going to feel like they're made for your body and made for human consumption. They're just not. One fallacy of harder climbing is this idea that harder climbing just means bigger moves between worse holds. Look, that idea carries some weight, for sure. But we also have to deal with really strange positions, not enough footholds, footholds that aren't where you want them, holds that face the wrong way. Things just get strange. We have to be able to put our conceptions of what good positions and comfort feel like in the back seat. Because a lot of things just aren't going to feel comfortable and nice and locked in and perfect. If you're finding yourself in situations where everything feels wrong, all the methods you've tried all feel wrong, honestly, just start trying harder and see what objectively is or isn't working. It doesn't matter if a move feels strange to you, if it's working every time. This will be a repeat experience in your climbing. You will go for a move that feels absurd and improbable, and you might even start looking at the ground to spot your landing, only to start to stick the move. And then you hit the ground because you didn't actually commit to it, and you're like, wait, hold on. That felt like it had a 0% chance. My brain was already thinking about how I was going to land, and I almost stuck it. What was that? What was this gap between perception and reality? And how do I close that gap? If you're trying to level up in climbing, you're going to run into more and more of these situations that just feel wrong. The best you can do is turn on your analytical brain and say, okay, this doesn't feel good, but how does it work? If I just give it a go with a little bit of gumption, objectively, Am I getting close to the hold? Am I getting close to sticking? Is it working better than other methods, regardless of how it kind of feels position-wise? What are the objective facts of the situation? As you get more repetitions in with this type of movement, this style, comfort will come. The understanding of the movement will come, and that gap between perception and reality will start to close as you understand what you're doing better but we have to keep nudging ourselves against this level of discomfort if we're going to break through that barrier and start to learn more. I appreciate y'all watching, and I'll see y'all next time.